Boy, heroes sure are busy. Being a protagonist is a complicated profession, and the one nice thing about it is you usually don't need to worry too much about the commute because the plot has a tendency to find you wherever you are. But being a danger magnet doesn't mean your average protagonist can slack off. A fundamental part of any standard issue hero's journey is the journey bit, and most protagonists will eventually find themselves jarringly uprooted from their home and turned loose in a big scary world to harrowingly make the grueling trek from point A to point B. And when that happens, it can be nice to have public transportation to rely on for some of that trekking. Or so you'd think, but a protagonist's work is never done, and while somebody from the real world might think of trains as reliable, fast, and comfortable modes of transportation, a character in the wonderful world of fiction should be aware that trains are plot magnets of the highest order, and there is no such thing as an uneventful journey. It's a pretty foundational rule of storytelling that most of the time we're going to be seeing our protagonists doing the plot. When the characters are doing anything other than plot advancement, it's usually thought of as filler, and for the sake of pacing, basic or repetitive elements of the story are usually skipped over. We're generally not glued to the protagonist 24-7, following them into all of their naps and bathroom breaks. And generally, it's pretty easy to subdivide a story into things that should be done on screen versus off screen. Unless you're hiding mysteries or crucial twists in the off screen zone, it's mostly reserved for boring, mundane, or time consuming logistical elements that the audience doesn't need to see to understand what's happening. While the on screen zone is for plot advancement, character arcs, and exposition about the way the world works. Basically, things the audience wants or needs to see to understand the story. As a side effect of this, an audience can generally assume that if the camera is following the characters through a seemingly mundane and uneventful scenario, it's probably going to stop being uneventful pretty quickly or else the camera wouldn't be there. And characters traveling to the next key plot location is a pretty common staple of the off-screen zone. If it isn't skipped over entirely, we might get a montage of the characters walking, riding, driving, sailing, or flying from point A to point B, with minor rest stops at interrupting plot points if the story is feeling spicy. But those interruptions are optional, and sometimes we'll just get a shot of the character getting on the transport, a wide shot of stock footage of the transport in motion, and then a shot of the character getting off the transport at their destination. So the plot can move on from there. There is plot to be found in the act of traveling itself, but unless the point of the story is to highlight the calm, boring mundanity of the process of travel, usually the plot we get to see happens in the form of environmental hazards or ambushes or other exciting cinematic twists and turns that disrupt the expected boringness of the travel. Generally, the traveling itself is kind of skipped over, or just happening in the background while the characters do other stuff. And this is reasonable, because usually a character in transit isn't going to be up to much. The one reliable exception to this rule is if the characters take a train. Trains are danger magnets, and if our heroes find themselves on a train for any reason, they are going to have to deal with a lot of train-specific hazards. In fact, they don't even need to be on the train for this principle to apply. The simple appearance of a train in the background of a set piece frequently demands that it be included in the choreography, usually by getting itself imperiled so the protagonists need to stop it. There are a number of reasons for this principle, first among them being that trains are rad as hell, but there's more to unpack here than just my transportational biases, so let's get into it. One big reason train fights are so common seems to be that they're multi-purpose. It lets the writer accomplish two things at once. In most transportation montages, the character's forward progression is interrupted by the plot when they get ambushed or deal with an environmental hazard or something, and then they have to backtrack or take the long way around or run away, and at the end of it, they still have to travel the rest of the way from point A to point B. Punching up the plot through exciting interruptions actually halts the overall advancement of the story by preventing our characters from continuing on to the next location where the main plot is. None of this applies in a train fight, because no matter what's happening in the train, the train is still usually getting from point A to point B the whole time. Even when the train's progress becomes part of the hazard, it's usually just because somebody cuts the brakes and the train starts making progress dangerously fast, which is still ultimately a good thing for the overall plot advancement. No villain schemes to stop the train and force the passengers to disembark early. This means the writers can throw whatever they want at the characters without impeding their ability to move the plot along by getting where they need to go, which is a very useful bit of sleight of hand. And on the flip side, if the characters don't want to go to the train's final destination for whatever reason, that automatically turns its arrival into a ticking clock. The characters have to deal with their plot-based problems before the train reaches its station, or a bridge that's out, or a dead end at alarmingly high speeds, or whatever's waiting at the end of the tracks. And if the story factors in the idea that the train is out of control and needs to be slowed down or diverted before impact, that adds tension to the ticking clock that makes the whole thing feel even more exciting. But logistics aside, even if the characters traveling to the train's destination isn't central to the plot advancement, trains and similarly shaped modes of transportation have a bunch of qualities that make choreographing fights in them very interesting. Most obviously, they're an innately claustrophobic environment. Trains are narrow, fast-moving cluttered environments without many places to hide. This can be good for high-octane fights as well as more slow-paced, sneaky conflicts, like if the protagonist needs to hide from bad guys in a space that's barely 10 feet across. Since a train is one big straight line, characters can't readily sneak past each other unless they go outside of it. And on that note, it is an absolute law of fiction that any characters fighting in or around a train must eventually take the fight on top of the train. The narrative benefits of this are obvious. This is an extremely perilous environment with high-speed hazards galore. Even 
and keeping one's footing is difficult and dangerous, and a character can be smoothly knocked out of the fight just by kicking them over the side, which makes for clean and efficient minion disposal or a convenient fake-out death for a protagonist who goes over the edge, which is shockingly common, especially if the train is going over water. Likely hazards include tunnels, inconveniently close spurs of rock, or support struts that our characters need to dodge around or get absolutely wrecked by. Mileage may vary depending on a character's individual power set. For some characters, this is a supremely deadly threat, but if, for example, the character having the train fight is Spider-Man, the peril is significantly reduced and the fight mostly turns into exciting acrobatic spectacle. Characters with mobility-improving power sets can usually have a pretty good time with a train fight, but even high-powered characters who are just heavy hitters might have a much more uncomfortable time slowly and carefully trying not to get absolutely bodied by the environment around them. And if they're particularly heavy hitters, they might end up in the unenviable position of needing to stop the train with their bare hands. This is actually one of the fun and subtle elements of the train fight. It provides a pretty versatile space of threats, so even if a character happens to have the right set of skills or powers to be categorically unconcerned with one of them, they can still end up having to wrangle something they're not prepared to just casually brush off. There's a reason trains are staples of superhero set pieces. Not even having Superman's powers will guarantee that a train will be 100% safe in his presence. And the primary reason this still manages to be a threat, even when the protagonists are Mondo overpowered, is that your average train is full of regular people who are not Mondo overpowered. If the heroes aren't navigating train choreography in fear for their own lives, they can definitely be persuaded to worry about the lives of everybody else. This is why the runaway train threat is so popular. The protagonists don't just need to worry about fighting off random mooks, they also need to worry about stopping 300 tons of high-speed metal before the laws of physics does it for them the messy way. The runaway train threat is basically a free bonus plot point that comes bundled with the train set piece, and plenty of writers take advantage of the package deal by casually knocking out the train brakes and giving the characters one more danger to deal with. If the train is full of innocent bystanders, they'll need to figure out a way to stop the train safely, which can be tough even for a superpowered badass, while if the train is empty, they'll just need to escape it safely before it goes boom, which can be a challenge for anybody if it's going fast enough. And of course, a train can provide a fascinating plot hook even if the characters are completely unconcerned with riding it. If the characters aren't on the train, the writer just needs to give them a reason to want something that's on the train. A MacGuffin held by an antagonist is the most common lore, or just a MacGuffin being hauled as cargo. And this segues cleanly into the extra fun subtrope of the train fight known as the train heist. It can include 100% of the same plot beats as the train fight, with the added bonus that the characters usually need to leap onto the moving train and break in from the outside. This has all the same perils as a standard train fight, plus an element of stealth, especially if the train has guards to prevent exactly this kind of thing. Train heists have the same final stop ticking clock as any train fight, with the added tension that the characters heisting the train almost certainly want to be well away from it by the time it arrives at its destination. Not only is the train probably well guarded, it's heading directly for the people likely to be most upset if it gets robbed. There are several little subtropes that are basically just stock beats of a train fight. Train-related hazards or complications that pop up pretty regularly. The runaway train threat is the big one, but one common factor is how the characters manage to get onto the train in the first place. If they don't board at the station like a civilized person, they probably have to launch themselves onto it from a height, catch up to it in another vehicle, or somehow both at once. Which is a fun and impressive stunt, even though, narratively speaking, the character is basically never actually in danger of missing the jump. You can't have a train fight if they don't get onto the train, so it's a bit of a foregone conclusion, even if it would be a very dangerous thing to do in real life. You also get things like one or more train cars being disconnected by pulling the pin between the cars. Apparently, it's just that easy. Which can complicate the runaway train threat significantly if the train still has a ton of momentum, but is now lacking a car with any actual controls that could stop it. This can also let the train fight get split across multiple tracks, or redirect part of the train to a hazardous stretch of rail, like a blown out bridge. Characters left on the wrong stretch of train have a brief and perilous window of time where they can leap from one train car to another. One extremely common beat of the train fight comes from the simple fact that most one-on-one -on -one train fights are choreographed along the direction of the train's travel, since that's the direction of the train that has the most space to work with, which means generally one participant in the fight can see where the train is going and, more importantly, what hazards are coming their way. So it's very common for the fighter in this advantageous position to fake out or distract their opponent in such a way that they get taken out by a low-hanging support strut or sign. And there's one more meta-narrative benefit to setting a conflict on a train. Since a train's primary deal is that it travels through areas that frequently don't have much else going on, the characters on the train can be effectively cut off from the outside world. It's a bottle episode on wheels, which is the term for a story that takes place almost entirely in a single location, usually to save money on production. But in a Watsonian sense, the bottle episode's primary strength is that it traps the characters in a tense situation and forces them to deal with it without outside resources or help. When the train is moving at high speeds, the characters typically can't leave because of the aforementioned speed problem. But stopping the train before it reaches its destination often causes a completely different kind of problem, by stranding the characters in the middle of nowhere. There's basically no easy way off a train until it gets where it's going, which means whatever happens on the train, the characters are stuck there until the writer decides to let them go. And since train journeys can take anywhere from minutes to days, a writer's got a very forgiving window 
of flexibility for keeping the characters stuck however long they need. This bottle episode setup can facilitate everything from train top punch-ups to slow-paced murder investigations where none of the characters involved can escape. And that's a formula for a lot more kinds of conflict than just trying not to fall off the roof. While train fights and train heists are the most visually spectacular kind of train plot, trains make a really good confined setting for all kinds of shenanigans. And as Murder on the Orient Express proved handily, the claustrophobic environment of a train can facilitate all kinds of tension and conflict without anyone having to at any point draw a weapon or initiate a physical brawl. It's a good thing nobody's ever jarringly shoehorned action sequences into an adaptation of it, and the mistaken idea that it would be really cool if Hercule Poirot had spent more time sprinting. One question I've been pondering the whole time I've been thinking about this trope is, why trains specifically? There's plenty of kinds of transportation, but none of them seem to have this many tropes this solidly defined around them. Cars are good for high-speed chases and getting wrecked, planes might get hijacked or wrecked, ships depend a lot on the setting but will usually be attacked by pirates or wrecked. If they aren't just being used to ferry the characters from point A to point B, their role in the story is still likely to be pretty one note, if they play a real role in the story at all. When a character in a movie gets in a car, that tells you nothing about how the scene is about to play out, because the fact that they're getting into a car specifically is usually usually not important. Maybe they're gonna get roped into a street race, which does kind of matter that they're in a car, but maybe they're just gonna have a contemplative private character moment, or maybe there's a murderer in the backseat and they're about to get super kidnapped. It's a very non-specific setting, and that means it doesn't have specific tropes. Something about trains makes them a playground for scene choreography, but I don't actually think trains are the only kind of vehicle that facilitates this kind of fight scene. And I know this because the Shang-Chi bus fight basically has all the same beats as a train fight. It just happens to take place on a bus and instead of a train. It utilizes the same narrow battlefield, part of the fight takes place on the outside of the bus, it even has a the brakes are out runaway vehicle subplot they need to resolve. The only difference is it isn't on rails. Trains are kind of in the Goldilocks zone of transportation when it comes to choreography potential. They're large enough to accommodate a decent sized cast of characters, protagonists, antagonists, and bystanders alike, unlike a small vehicle like a car, which can basically house a half dozen people tops, fewer if anyone's throwing elbows. But trains aren't so large that they give the characters too much freedom of movement, like if a story is set on a cruise ship or similarly massive transport. The characters can go outside the train, but it's not completely safe. Another Goldilocks zone between vehicles like cars, where you can stop them and get out no problem, or vehicles like submarines and airplanes, where there is absolutely no safe way to leave them before they reach their destination. So you end up with room for a decent sized cast where they still feel trapped with one another. Moderate levels of peril that aren't immediately deadly for anyone who goes out through a window, and a metric buttload of little plot hooks and environmental hazards the characters can deal with while they work their way around the space. Another benefit might be that trains can be justified in showing up in a lot of different settings. Anything modern has trains galore, no matter how many superheroes are running around in it. If it's anything historical post-1800, you can easily slap a steam train in there. If it's a fantasy setting, you can finagle a wizard with weird ideas into laying down some tracks. Even in space adventure sci-fi, you can throw together a maglev monorail high-speed super train to justify that it's in space. Even post-apocalypses can have working trains. And circling back to that very first point, almost like we're on a rail of some kind, it can be very beneficial for a writer to give their characters a fast way to get from point A to point B. There's a real incentive to work trains or train-like transportation into stories if the writer doesn't want to write three months of hiking and camping or time skip through a lot of potentially juicy character development time. I feel like the reason train fights are so popular across so many genres is just that trains happen to have won the trope lottery. They're suitable to too many environments, they work in too many contexts, they facilitate too many exciting action scenes and challenge the characters in too many unique ways. You may not like it, but this is is what peak performance looks like. So, yeah?